Hey everybody, we are back from Gen Con and I apologize for the delay in getting some information out to you guys for how the show was and kind of what we got up to there. But this is a good time to bring up our public service message, which is COVID is not gone. And um, though we did not end up testing positive for COVID on return, we definitely had a hideous case of con crud when we came back. Um, and I guess that is what happens when you put yourself in um, space with 70,000 of your uh, best gaming buddies, right? Was it worth it? Absolutely. Would I do it again? Absolutely. So it is what it is. Sometimes you just got to take one for the team, right? But anyway, we're back. And I just kind of wanted to give you guys a little catch up on what we got up to when we were at the show, um, what we kind of thought. It was so much fun being back. It really was. Next year, we will definitely be there uh, for the entirety of the show because um, just like going to Disney World or something, you know, like you cannot see and do everything in one day. You just can't. And um, we went this last time being a little less structured than maybe what we've done previously, where we just freeformed. We went and looked at stuff. You know, of course, I did all kinds of research ahead of time because spreadsheets and that's my jam um but i you know i looked up things to see what was going to be new what sounded like it was going to be the hot ticket items that we needed to pay attention to and then it just became like who do we want to reconnect with we haven't we haven't caught up with everybody in ages and so this was just a really good opportunity so that's exactly what we did so what did we get into while we were there? I figure I'll do a little bit of show and tell. I'm not going to go in depth with any of these things because we'll probably do um, maybe a little bit more formal unboxing type things uh, for some of it. But I just figured we'd talk kind of about what we did and kind of what happened while we were there. So I have to start with probably what was the coolest moment uh, for us at the show. And it was like the darn near first thing that we did when, when we got in there. Our strategy when we go to these shows usually is when we go in, we don't start at the front and work our way back because that's what most people do because you got shiny syndrome as soon as you walk through the doors and you it log jams there, right? So when we got inside, we went all the way to the back and kind of started working our way back that way. And um, closer to that back section there was our friends over at Modifius. And so we had to go stop and say hi to Chris and Greg and Alicia there first. And what a special treat. So we got up over there and um, I came into the possession of a rare artifact, which you can see I'm wearing right here. And it came in a lovely little box and I took it out and I put it on and uh, there was a QR code in the box for me to scan. So I scanned it with my phone and it took me to this little video and I was hooked. So uh, this video, I came into the possession of this strange artifact. It's very important and I need to go connect with the right people that can help tell me what it means and, and what I have to do next, right? So I, I went over to find, find these people that I had to connect with. And I had the opportunity to spend a few minutes with the coolest cosplayers in the entire world, right? So I, I walked up to them and they were in full costume. And if you um, saw any of our Facebook posts, I did post pictures of this too. There was a little video and unfortunately we didn't, I wasn't mic'd so you couldn't really hear the conversation that great but I was literally dropped into like a little mini LARP situation which was super cool because I've never done anything like that before and um, definitely made the light bulb go off that there's a real opportunity for me there and I'm gonna probably have to check that out at some time but my new friends were um, telling me that they've seen others with this artifact and you know so i was not the first but this is very important and they were trying to determine whether i could be trusted or not i was kind of feeling them out in the same way we didn't want to give away too much information but just that this is very ancient and it's very powerful and we need to find the others that that have come into the possession of these two right so with that the segue brought over into them handing me a copy of Dreams and Machines. And this is super cool. So obviously this is a RPG, but 
it looks super streamlined and really interesting and easy to get in and play. Um, the art is popping. I mean, it is it is so beautiful. So I'm gonna do a formal unboxing of this another time because I really wanna take you guys through um, the parts in this, but <clears throat> really amazing setting. And these artifacts are obviously going to play a role in the machines that we're talking about in here. Uh, they actually bring to life uh, some of uh, some of these machines and help power and fuel things. And, you know, so this is your classic scenario where, you know, yes, these exist. What do they mean? Obviously, there's going to be several camps of what people think about this. Um, there's going to be the, the people that are super enthusiastic and interested and really want to, you know, think that this is great and important and we should use these artifacts. And then there's going to be the others who think, you're playing with something dangerous. We don't know it and understand it. What we don't know and understand can be scary and we want no part of it, right? So it's gonna be all about finding your way through this, but I cannot wait to play this. And like I said, and in terms of an introduction experience to the hook to get your attention and get you into this game, I was blown away. It was like the best possible way to start a Gen Con. All right. Where do we go from there? From there, we just wandered, right? And we started talking um, to people that we hadn't seen uh, for a really long time. And like I said, I mentioned to you, I had a little hot list of things that seemed interesting to me. So I wanted to be able to take a look at them. One of those things is uh, this game called Legacy Allure. Legacy's Allure. It's a card game. No surprise there, right? Because you know me and I love my card games. But what I really thought was great about this, two things. If you've never heard of this game, like I said, Legacies Allure, look it up. And there is a little how to play YouTube video. And th that video was so well done. It was so easy to understand what you needed to do with the game. And they are clever as all get out. And I, I don't want to spoil there. Uh, they get into a little tangent about the map that comes with it in this game. And uh, it cracked me up. So I made sure I told them how much I enjoyed that video when we were there uh, talking to them because it really was too funny. But what I thought was so cool about this game, and Bill actually was really interested in it too because for a change, he was the instigator behind us purchasing this. I had already been considering it, but he was like, you know what, I think I, think I want us to get that game. So that, that was cool. <clears throat> What I think is great about this game is that it is a uh, competitive card game where you're going to be playing head to head uh, and uh, you're going to have different factions that are going to go against each other. But what is really cool is that um, they compare it a lot to the strategy involved in a game of chess, which is an interesting concept to me. And don't kill me in the comments because I don't know how to play chess. Something I, it's on my list of things to do. I really need to learn. I don't know why I haven't yet, but anyway. Um, but they really focus on the fact that the way you need to play this game and the strategy that you need to bring into it has you bringing your thoughts together in a progression the way you would approaching a game of chess. So that said, like I mentioned, it's a card game, which normally you're just taking turns playing your cards and whatever. But in this game, it's kind of, to me, this feels like the perfect gateway game to take somebody that has only ever played board, board and card games maybe and bridge the gap over into tabletop miniatures gaming because you're going to have a mat that's going to be played out on the table and there is hexes, large hexes in this mat and your cards are going to be, everybody that you're playing is going to be out on the board right from the beginning, occupying physical spaces. And so as you're doing things in the game, you will be moving your characters and cards up in different locations and accomplishing your battles and things like that um, on this format. So to me, it, it, it really feels like an awesome gateway experience for somebody that maybe has never even considered or doesn't even really know what miniature tabletop gaming is to, to kind of test the waters and see if it's something that they might like to do because it's a perfect opportunity. If they play through the game, they really like it, you can go, okay, now what if we played a game like that where you had actual miniatures, right? So it's like life-changing experience potentially, but... Like I said, um, I really think this sounds like an awesome game. And we went in for their all-in bundle because, you know, 
that's us. And uh, that gave us one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight other little faction decks that came with it. And there's already two in this box to get you started. So it gives you a really nice opportunity to try different different um, armies and different play styles. Obviously, like any kind of card game, they're going to play in very different ways. Um, some will be more magic driven, some will be more physical tanks, you know, things like that. But uh, really looking forward to having a play with that one. Uh, next thing, uh, you know me, I love my board games also. And anything that allows me to get um, both Disney and board games in um, a scenario, I find pretty awesome. So next thing I picked up was um, by Goliath Games. And this is Alice's Garden. And I am going to, actually, I'm not going to show a little bit. Like I said, I'm going to do a little unboxing and we'll we'll talk through pieces of this. But this game, I was so excited with because it basically functions almost like a Tetris, if you will, but in a physical form. And you're going to be competing to complete the Queen's Garden um, as much to her liking as you can possibly do it. And so the pieces in there are going to be very specific different shapes and you'll have to try to fill things in to the best of your ability and rack up as much as, as much points as you can and so there will be a section of your board you'll have each player will have a little player board in front of them they're two-sided so you can decide um, how easy or more difficult you want to make it and i say easy l using that term loosely because it still can be very challenging because you're very tempted to do you blindly just put stuff down and make them fit as best you can, which rightfully so will in theory fill your garden probably up the most efficiently. However, you're going to miss real opportunities for scoring points because the colors, um, the patterns that are on your board are going to potentially coincide with pieces that you're going to be drawing. And the more that you can, like the chessboard section of the board, if you can play the pieces that have a chessboard, a chess piece on them in that area, you'll get extra points for that. The, the queen of hearts, you know, she loves her red roses. And so the more clumps of red roses that you can get together um, on the board, the more points you're going to get for that. So it's, it is very cool. It is very strategic. So it sounds like it's, it's one of those games that you can make it be as super simple or as very complicated as you want it to be. It's all the way you want to play. The other thing I thought was really cool about this game is that you can play it solo. Obviously, playing anything solo is never going to be as much fun as having that sit-down experience with somebody else or others. But uh, the fact that you can kind of just challenge yourself to see how, how best you can get your pieces out, how you can try to beat your personal best score, I think is, is really fun. So that was um, my next little pick while we were there. Next place uh, we stopped off at was at... The Infinity Booth, because I hadn't seen Carlos in ages. It was always great to see him. He's full of energy. Surprisingly, we were there on a Saturday, and he actually had a voice. Probably almost unheard of, um, because, you know, typically by that day in the convention, he's, he's in a whisper, because he has been so high energy and talking, you know, the entire time that he can barely get a word out. But we had a great little catch-up with him. And uh, I was very excited to see they had, and now it's the name is going to completely escape me. So I'll have to, I'll have to come, come back to it if I if it'll jog my memory. But they are going to have a new game coming out um, next year sometime, and I, they had a demo table out with basically just scenery and um, mock-ups out there for people uh, for people to see because the table looked extremely striking. It looks very different from Infinity. It's got a totally different feel to it. Definitely catches your eye. And he said, you know, if stars align and everything goes smoothly, hopefully they're going to have uh, a working copy of it to do actual demos at Adepticon uh, next year. So there's something to look forward to in that, but we did get their little press package, which is always lots of fun. So in the press package, we got a couple of buttons, got a, a code one and a tag raid button, got a couple copies of uh, the Maximus card for Aristea. I'll bring up a close cam here so you can see that. So that is cool stuff. 
while I'm on the close cam here. Uh, we got a little little dice or a token bag for Aristea. You gotta say the artwork on everything that um, Corvus Belly puts out is just beautiful. It's very eye-catching. Got a Infinity Code 1 patch. That's totally going on my backpack. Except, you know what's funny? Bill and I discovered I don't have a lot of spaces for, I don't have a lot of um, Velcro on my backpack. So we'll have to fix that. And then, of course, we got the promo mini that they're running at the convention. And here we are. And, you know, they... I have to say, you know, I have not been the biggest metal mini person. And it's and it's funny. I think I just find them harder to put together and um, kind of fight with glue points and stuff. Now, I can't say that I have ever specifically had that problem with any of the Infinity models, but some of the some some companies, metal minis, you know, the bigger they are, the more likely you are to have to pin points and stuff like that. I just don't like messing with anything like that. But you can't deny that they get such an incredible level of detail on these. And even if you are not a super accomplished painter that can paint like uh, Anne Harrell does, you know, you're going to, even just with a, a couple colors and a really good effort with a wash and a dry brush, the detail that you can pick up from these minis are absolutely insane. So, and I do have to say there is the, something satisfying about the weight of a metal mini. That is a point that I will absolutely um, say I agree with. <clears throat> And then lastly, we got um, a little quick start rules. They have a little double-sided book here, quick start rules for code one. And on the other side, uh, Aristea. So I thought that was just a really nice little uh, press package that they put together. It gave us a, a little bit of everything and, and lots of stuff to talk about. But, you know, I, just great to catch up with Carlos as always. Next up. Um, this is going to be what I will call our, our big purchase for it. And it, it, it's not like the world's biggest purchase. These are all the little decks for that Legacy's Allure game. But we caught up with our friends over at Firelock Games. And this one, <laughs> look at that. You're not even going to be able to see me. There I am. Uh, we got the Blood and Plunder two-player starter set. And this we will definitely do a formal unboxing of, and I'm gonna have to move it out of the way, otherwise we're just not gonna be able to have a chat here. But um, I was really excited to see that you can get this all together in one package, right? Because now it out of the box, you're gonna be good to go for two players to be able to play at the same time. The only problem we're gonna have right now is we're gonna have to rock, paper, scissors over who gets to be the pirates and who doesn't because everybody wants to be the pirates, or at least I do. Um, but what I thought was awesome is that these are plastic now. So again, to what I was just talking about, like I, I just prefer the plastic minis. And so that was a big win for me. But ships come in this box. That was what really won me over is because, you know, from the first time that we saw Blood and Plunder, I just the ships on the table and being able to play pirates and be on a ship, you know, of course, stuff happens on land too, right? And I get that. And you should be able to do that in both ways. But I'm a pirate. I want to be on a ship. And previously, you had to get ships separately. And they're not cheap, of course, you know, but really nothing in mini gaming is. But the fact that out of the box, it comes with two. So, you know, everybody will be able to have both their characters as well as a cool ship. I'm pumped. So this is a, a really, really good sweet spot, I think, uh, for Bill and I, because, you know, Bill is lives, prefers to live in the land of historical and I live in the land of nonsense. This bridges the gap between the two because they are historical and potentially can tap into uh, the fictional aspect for, you know, the way that we know of mainstream pirates from things like Pirates of the Caribbean and stuff like that, right? Based on fact, um, but you can take some liberties with that. And I'm all about taking the liberties into the nonsense of things. But this, I think, is going to be a really great place for us uh, to be able to 
play some play some games and in a setting that we can both get behind and it's not just one placating the other right so looking forward to a lot more of that and i know marty also um it loves his blood and blunder stuff so we already have another person that's really into it you know that'll want to play with us which is cool so shopping wise, that was all we picked up while we were there, which I was quite proud of ourselves because that's very unlike us. But it is, you know, if you've ever been or you've never been, the walking that you have to do and from where you're going to end up parking, you really do have to pick and choose what you want to buy and carry around with you all day. And like, and, and it becomes a really strategic choice because, of course, we found that really early and I, I saw the size of the box and thought, I am not carrying that around with us all day long. But then you're also playing the game of, but what if they don't have them by the end of the day when I come back to it? These are, this is the game of games within Gen Con, right? But we were able to get back and get that, you know, later in the day, which is good. But I, I can say at the, at the Goliath stand, when I went back for the Alice game, there was also another game, um, a, a, what the heck is the name of it? Honey Buzz might have been the name of it. And uh, it was a B game. And again, it was another um, kind of puzzly-ish game. Had adorable little beeples. Come on, I have to get it if it has beeples. Beeples! But they were out of it. And this this is what happens. Like, I should have picked it up when we were there and saw it earlier in the day. And I thought, again, I'll do my shopping at the end of the day. And then I wasn't able to pick it up. But what are you going to do? Another person we had a super awesome catch up with uh, was Ronnie Renton over at Mantic. Always a pleasure to talk to Ronnie because he is a bundle of energy and he loves to spill the beans, right? And so we kind of stood at the case, talked through what was coming, and uh, Bill was super excited uh, to talk to him about them uh, producing their game in a little teeny tiny epic scale, right? Because Bill loves his epic scaled everything. And so we had a really good conversation about where they're at with that, if it's going to happen. And it's still in the realm of possibilities right now. Nothing has been decided. And, you know, they're testing the waters because, of course, timing wise, um, GW brought, you know, brought out the news that they're, they're bringing back Epic. And it just... It's tough when you when you're a game company and you got to look at what everybody else is doing and you're trying to keep up with the Joneses but keep yourself new and fresh and you know relatable. It it's tough. You have to pick and choose whether it's the right time to to make a move like that. I think this sounds like they're leaning towards it. He was sure pumped about it, so we'll have to keep our eyes peeled and and see where we go from there. But Super fun stuff. Bill and I did uh, talk after we were catching up with Ronnie, and I do think Kings of War is uh, something that we are going to kind of commit to getting into more. Just rules-wise, easy to play, looks amazing out on the table with lots and lots of characters, and I have the perfect in for me being the non-enthusiastic painter that I am. I am going for an Ent army, right? Because I am confident that I can make trees, I can paint trees uh, that are going to look fine and I, I hopefully I will actually feel like happy with how they look, can flock a little bit on there, make you know, to, to fancy it up a little bit, and I can feel like an accomplished painter <laughs> for the first time ever in my life. We'll see. Stay tuned for more of that because that'll be something that we're going to be looking into exploring. Beyond that, obviously, unless you've been living under a rock, the, the big, big thing at Gen Con was the hype around uh, Ravensburger's Disney Lorcana, which I, you know, have been talking about since we heard about it and have been super excited about it. That was sure insanity. I mean, just pure, out of control. I... Uh, on our way down there, you know, I, I was watching the posts and seeing kind of what was going on. And I heard all about um, the line fiascos and how long people were lined up. They after after the first night of the show, um, after the first day of the show, we should say when people had lined up and there was quite a bit of difficulty getting getting people organized and in and people lost their places in line. They ran out of product super early. Like it was, it was a brand new game that was being released at Gen Con that everyone was excited about. And it just, it's tough. 
So lots of people did not end up with cards. I was one of those people. But I also, after I heard how it went that first day with people lining up, I had made the decision for myself that I was not going to even try to get in a line for it because we only had a limited amount of time, you know, to be there at Gen Con. And I didn't want to commit that much chunk of my time to waiting in a line for something. So you're welcome to anybody that got cards instead of me while, while you were there. I took the liberty of stalking our favorite local game stores website throughout the show. And when I saw a quantity become available for pre-order, I pre-ordered myself two boxes and then I felt done, accomplished. I was going to have cards. I was going to have them at the pre-release date before September 1st. And now I didn't have to feel like I needed to be part of the stress that was participating in that line shenanigans to maybe or maybe not be able to get product because there were people that that lined up that didn't make the cutoff before they ran out of product and weren't able to get stuff. So what are you going to do? Um, I will be talking about Lorcana in a totally separate video because it is super cool and I am very excited and we'll just leave it at that. The last thing I will say, I participated in a Star Wars Unlimited Learn to Play event. And um, again, much like I've been super pumped about Disney New Lorcana, I have been super excited about the new trading card game from Fantasy Flight that's going to be Star Wars Unlimited. That was not available at the show. It will not release until next year. So that will probably be next year's Gen Con crazy. Um, but for this year, it was just a ton of hype about the game and people being able to physically hold some cards and try things out in the demo. I'm going to do a separate video to talk about how that went, but that was the one event thing that I was able to participate in. I wasn't able to get a ticket for a demo event of Disney Lorcana, so I did not get to do that while we were at the convention, but I at least did get to play some Star Wars, so that was very fun. But anyway, that was Gen Con for us, short of coming home with the uh, only thing that we got for free from Gen Con, which was uh, Con Crud. And as you can tell by my still little bit of raspy and occasional cough, we're mostly over it, um, but it was rough. It was rough. So, but always a pleasure. Can't wait to go again next year. Can't wait to have more time to spend when we go next year. But thanks for uh, hanging out with me today and talking about Gen Con. And uh, I hope you continue watching us. Like and follow us on social media and our YouTube channel, Other Realms. And until then, I will see you guys in the next one.